Okay, morning, everybody. I guess we can start. Did everybody receive the survey? Yeah, no? So there's a survey here, and uh, you may give it back here. Whoever of you who haven't, hasn't done this, you can put it there later. Okay, today we have, in principle, four more hours. Let's try to see what we can do. So the idea is that uh, we move a little bit uh, forward in time, because so far we have seen just physics from the 70s. Uh, there were uh, fundamental results from the 70s, but we would like to see what has been done after that. So we will do something from the 80s, something from the 90s, and something from the 2000s. Not the most recent stuff, but still quite recent stuff. So things will become more and more, uh, perhaps a bit advanced and more vague. But this just to give you some ideas, and then of course, if you're interested, you should read the, you should read the relevant literature. So um, the first topic I would like to discuss is a, a Bloom's ADS space. Uh, for two reasons. One is that we're discussing this interpretation of, um, of the gravitational partition function as a statistical partition function, or as the canonical, grand canonical partition function. So we know that there, there can be different solutions that contribute to the path integral, to the saddle point uh, approximation of the path integral, and these can compete between each other. Yesterday we saw there is flat space, there is a Schwarzschild black hole, and uh, in ADS, this is also the case. And in ADS, there is a phenomenon that two solutions uh, that are both non-trivial, like ADS, the maximally symmetric solution, and the black hole in ADS can compete. And therefore, you have to check which of the two dominates. Maybe one dominates in some regime of the parameters. The other one dominates in another regime. And so between the two, you have, between the two regimes, you have a phase transition. So this is the reason why uh, the ADS case, and the other reason is ADS-CFT. So this course is about ADS-CFT. We had a course about ADS-CFT last year by Dario, who is over there. And uh, so this is not the topic of the talk. Uh, but uh, still, I would like to make the connection because, I mean, it's a very important uh, thing uh, that is very relevant, uh, of course, for black holes in ADS. So the first part is something that was done by Hawking and Page well before ADS-CFT, without knowing anything about ADS-CFT. And uh, the reason why Hawking and Page in the early 80s were interested in models uh, in ADS is that we had seen a couple of lectures ago that uh, the canonical ensemble is not, uh, does not exist for black holes in, uh, in uh, asymptotically flat black holes because we had seen that the uh, heat capacity of the Schwarzschild black hole, for instance, is negative. So there is no equilibrium between uh, the black hole and radiation in, uh, in a synthetically flat case. So Hawking and Page were led to consider the ADS case where you can have equilibrium because ADS is like a space with the boundary. The boundary is at conformal inf infinity. So it does not a sharp boundary, but it's at infinity. But still, you can see it as a space with a boundary. So it's like a, a space with a, a big potential and reflecting boundary conditions. So the radiation can go out but come back in, and you can have equilibrium with the black hole. So this is a bit the picture. And this is the reason, if you read their, page, their paper, uh, they talk about these things. So this is the reason why they consider that. So, Let's come to some formulae. So uh, again, this will be mostly uh, motivated by the fact that we want, to, we want to study phase transitions. Of course, before having the transition, you need the, can the canonical or grand canonical ensemble to be well defined, and this is what uh, the ADS case does. So I just repeat what we saw yesterday. When we, you have different solutions, you need to sum in the path integral, and uh, 
these all contribute, this classical solution corresponds to a set of points of the integral. So you may have e to the minus i of the first solution. This is the action, Euclidean action. Then there is the other one, etc. And then they can compete, and one of the two will dominate over the other. In a classical approximation, only one is important, because the other one is exponentially suppressed. You have to check. Uh, so the question is, uh, once I impose boundary conditions, how many solutions do I have? It's not, uh, an an there's no answer a priori. You have to check. It is believed, uh, I think, that in ADS, what we are going to see, there are just two solutions with the boundary conditions I will discuss, that is, uh, that are static, uh, that is uh, uh, ADS itself and uh, the Schwarzschild solution. But in principle, there may be others. Um, so in the solution with the least action will dominate the ensemble and it may be that this solution has least action for some regime of the parameters for, for instance for some values of the temperature and this will dominate for some other regime of the parameter so this of course we need to have some parameter and this will be our beta that we introduced um, in the previous lectures So we want to study these kind of phase transitions. And uh, so uh, since we want to be in ADS, we need to introduce a cosmological constant. So our Euclidean action. Will be uh, the usual Einstein-Hilbert one. minus the cosmological constant, eh, plus, and it's a negative cosmological constant. So here I haven't put the number of dimensions yet, because uh, this can be done in dimension, in principle. Uh, this kind of argument, and what I'm going to present, the Schwarzschild black hole exists uh, for any uh, dimension you may want to consider, four, five. Well, in lower dimension it's more tricky, but still. Uh, we work in five dimensions. Okay, you may ask why we have been working in four dimensions so far. So let's, okay, first let's change. Let's vary a bit, a, bit, a little bit. Nothing changes. You can do uh, everything in four dimensions, but for the ADS-CFT purposes is more natural. Or, uh, the, the original uh, ADS-CFT interpretation was uh, using 5D black hole, but uh, it has been immediately generalized. Um, by the same author, we will discuss this in a second. So there are two possible solutions that we may want to consider. One is ADS, so let's, let's write the <coughs> ma matrix. So solution one, solution one, that I call X1, is um, just the matrix of ADS space in Euclidean signature, so we have the Euclidean time tau. So by d omega 3 here, I mean the uh, matrix on the three sphere, the unit matrix on the three sphere. If you want, I can also write what it is. It is d omega 3. There is d theta squared plus sin squared theta d phi squared. So this is the metric on the sphere. And then we need to add the uh, direction. If you see this as a hop vibration, this is one way of expressing the unit metric on the three sphere. I think I need a factor of one quarter there for the radius to be one. And the function of r squared over, uh, yes. So here we have one parameter, L, which is uh, controlling the curvature of ADS and uh, uh, comes from the fact that we have a cosmological constant here that uh, is controlled by this parameter, L. So it's actually the of ADS. is the length parameter that controls uh, the curvature. So the curvature will go as 1 over squared, 
and it is normalized in such a way that this is exactly what is usually called the radius of ADS. So this is the matrix of ADS5, and it's a solution to this, uh, to the Einstein equation associated with that matrix, with that uh, action. So here we can choose to identify the Euclidean time, but we don't have any regular condition imposed uh, uh, near to origin. Uh, here, this part of the matrix degenerates, that is, closes off uh, for R. So this, there is a tree sphere that shrinks there. So uh, um, as long as I move along the radial direction, it closes off in a regular way because I say this is the unit matrix on the tree sphere. This means that this closes off regularly because this, this function f goes to 1 for r equals 0. So everything is here, and the time uh, coordinate remains there. The time direction of the circle, that remains a circle, doesn't shrink. This goes to, this f goes to 1, and r goes to 0. So everything is regular by itself. Already. There is no need to impose any particular condition on the uh, length of the Euclidean time. So we can choose whatever length we want. We may even choose not to compactify it, but let's uh, always think about these thermal ensembles are always compactified time, and then in case you may take the beta to infinity limit if you want to decompactify it. It's always in this way that you should understand this uh, thermodynamics. <laughs> so this is what is called thermal ADS. It's uh, ADS Euclidean space, so I've already big rotated the solution to Euclidean space, and uh, it's called thermal because I can temperature, but there is no restriction on the value of the temperature, it can be a whatever. So this is solution one. I should also describe the topology, but it's what I just said. Basically, I just described it with my hands. Uh, there is a, a thermal circle of length beta that doesn't shrink, so it remains like that. And then the rest is, a, is something that closes off regularly, and uh, so it, we could say it's just uh, R4, the four-dimensional uh, flat space topologically. Then there is this function that deforms the space a bit, but it's uh, topologically is, is like R4, or if we want to include the fact that we have a boundary, so include the points at the boundary, uh, that is at infinity, we may say it's the four ball, in the sense it's a flat space, and then it has a boundary that is a three sphere. So it's B4, the four dimensional ball, which has a sphere as a boundary. The, three, the sphere is this one, it's at infinity boundary, but, uh, but we may want to include it. So that's the topology of this space. And, uh, yeah, another comment about that is that, okay, we do ADS5 not for uh, random reasons, but also because this is easily embedded in string theory. So uh, it's a well-known solution of type 2B string theory, uh, not only of type 2B, but in particular the simplest uh, ADS5 solution you may obtain uh, in uh, string theory is type 2B times uh, type 2B on S5, and uh, this ha admits an ADS5 solution. So it's ADS5 times S5 that uh, can be embedded in type 2B. And uh, so you have a theory with uh, bosons uh, and fermions. String theory is approximated by supergravity in 10 dimensions. It has bo both bosons and fermions, as you have extensively seen in all uh, the previous courses. And so you may want to consider uh, bosonic and fermionic fields on this background. And... Uh, so you have to decide what are the boundary conditions for them. So for the bosons, okay, you just ask that they are periodic in the uh, time circle. Uh, for the fermions, you may decide. You may want to have periodic or anti-periodic boundary conditions. And this space admits both. So uh, you know that uh, the question of structures is a topological question. So in this case, when you have a circle, you can always, the, spin, the choice of spin structure amounts to choosing whether the fermions are periodic or anti-periodic when you do a, a tour around the circle. And in this case, the topology allows to propose choices. So we can really basically do what we want here. So this is the first comment, because of course, boundary conditions are important, as we said. We need always to compare solutions after having checked that the boundary conditions agree. 
So this is the first solution. Um, okay, I'll say this later. There is another solution, solution two, that I call X2, that is uh, kind of similar, but uh, it's actually a black hole, so it's uh, crucially different. So, so far it looks really the same, but the function f is not the same. So I should call it uh, g. It's another function. So the function up to here is the same as above. This and these are the same. But I introduce this extra term. And this is uh, crucial for the topology and the geometry of the solution. So this w you may think it's related to the mass of this black hole that we are introducing, which is correct, but there is a numerical factor. That's why I'm calling it W instead of M. It's, uh, I think, something like W. Well, let me not commit to a precise factor. It's proportional to M. It's 8 over 3 pi, I think. This can also be written as as a polynomial with uh, two roots, although one comes at uh, negative values of r squared. But never mind, I'm going to focus on r plus, which is the largest one. So there is a relation between these roots. Okay, so now we should study the solution. Uh, again, we start from infinity. Infinity at infinity looks like ADS because this piece uh, dies off. It's not important at infinity. So we have we have the same solution as before. We can compare the two solutions. But while we go inside uh, the solution, this term becomes important until when this function f now vanishes when we reach R plus. Okay, so we reach R plus, this function f vanishes, so now we have some constraints on the time direction because this function shrinks. And this function shrinks before we reach zero. So in this case, the sphere remains it there, it doesn't uh, shrink to zero size while we reduce R, but this direction, this circle shrinks when we reach R plus. Is it, uh, we have a, uh, the radial direction starts from infinity. And I have at the boundary I have S1 times uh, S3. S1 is the circle of length beta. I still haven't fixed beta so far, but we have, we have compactified it. And then S3 is always there at any point. At any, at any point. Then we go on. S3 remains S3. So this is r equal infinity. Here is r equal uh, r plus. But the, the circle shrinks to zero size, again with the shape of this cigar that we saw. So from this picture, so S3 remains S3 all the time. So the topology is uh, like this one is the two-dimensional ball or a disk. It's something that has a boundary, the, the, the circle. The circle has a boundary. So it's uh, the two-dimensional ball times uh, S3. And the boundary is this one, S1 times S3. The, so the boundary is the same for both, but the interior is different. So the whole topology now is different. And uh, so there are two things we should realize. First, the conditions on uh, the identification of the Euclidean time. Now we have to make sure that this closes off regularly. And we've seen 
how to do this by going near to our equal R plus, expanding the matrix, checking the, the coordinate, uh, the angular coordinate that is there is the integral of the path. And if you do all this, we have seen this a couple of times already, so I'm not going to redo that. You find that there is a prescribed temperature that will depend on R plus. So R plus, you can see, is mass that you are introducing. So there is one parameter, this M, M minus plus, and the other parameter is the ADS uh, length. Uh, so one is at the parameter of the solution, that is this M or W here. The other one is the parameter of the theory, because it's already in the action. It is the ADS, the cosmological constant, uh, one over L squared. So there are these two parameters, and these enter in fixing the temperature, the inverse temperature. Um, this is what you get. It's a function of these two parameters. And uh, you can also see that now there is no problem of instability. When if you compute the heat capacity, the heat capacity turns out to be negative. Uh, sorry, not negative. And uh, so at least, uh, so there are two possible so black kind of black holes. And one of the two has positive uh, heat capacity. And, and so there is no such a problem with the instability thermodynamical instability. And uh, the other thing we should uh, ask about is what kind of boundary conditions can I impose when uh, I consider a, th a theory of and fermions on this, uh, on this geometry. And uh, so now we should, uh, again, for bosons there is no problem with the periodic boundary conditions, sense. And now for the fermions, we have a uh, this question of what are the allowed spin structures on this manifold with this topology of the ball, two ball times S3, which is different from the circle times the four ball. And uh, it turns out that uh, this topology allows only for one spin structure, that is the one of antiperiodic fermions around the circle. So only antiperiodic fermions. This is for topological reasons. So the way to see this, so now is, there is a rather more or less intuitive way to see this. Uh, so I say the spin structure amounts to asking this case, when I have this circle at the boundary, uh, asking if the fair do a two this circle if the fermions are periodic or antiperiodic. This is the choice of spin structure. You can see this has to be consistent everywhere. It has to be, con to be consistent also there. But there you, you see flat space, because we are saying we are closing off the space as, as if it was flat space there, because this is the regularity condition. And in flat space, the fermion wave function picks up a minus sign when you go around. So this is the reason why, for consistency with this topology here, with the topology of the disk, Need to take anti-periodic boundary conditions at the boundary and everywhere else. It's because of this shape. Before we didn't have this shape for a circle. The circle remained everywhere, didn't shrink. So this is the reason why uh, this is a necessary choice in this uh, in this topology. So. Now that we have studied and uh, considered two solutions, ah, here it is. Uh, so this is the Euclidean version of a black hole. I mean, I could rotate it to a Lorentzian signet, it would have Schwarzschild black hole. It's a Euclidean friend. And uh, so we could, comp uh, using thermodynamics, we could compute uh, the action that we're going to compare the two actions now, but uh, this is just to say that here we have the we could comp compute uh, the mass and see that it is indeed uh, related to this parameter W. We could even compute the entropy as we did yesterday for Kurt Newman in, flat, in asymptotically flat space. So everything works out in uh, ADS, uh, uh, asymptotically ADS spaces in the same way. You still get entropy is area of the over four. 
But now uh, what we are interested in is to compare these two solutions in the gravitational path integral. And uh, so we, can ask, we should ask, uh, do these two solutions compete? Uh, they compete if we impose the same boundary conditions. But we saw that one allows for two kinds of boundary conditions. The other one competes uh, only with the other one, only when the boundary conditions... So it's present in, the, in, our, uh, in our ensemble only if the boundary conditions are anti-periodic. So if I do periodic... periodic boundary conditions for the fermions, then only solution one is allowed. And therefore, uh, well, there's, there's just the solution. The, yes, there's a question. Yes, anti-periodicity follows from regularity, yes. But what happens if we go back in the realms of signature? Because this one is an artifact because of the bleak and signature I call regularity on the horizon. So what happens if I just want to do this kind of computation? Is this all this preserved or does something change? Uh, so in Lorentzian signature, you don't uh, compactify the time, so you don't ask about these questions. But uh, uh, the only meaningful way to discuss this thermodynamics is to go Euclidean, because... I mean, I could also take uh, some different uh, Hamiltonian approach, uh, compute Green's functions, and there I would also have a, a minus or not. I think maybe there would be a Lorentzian interpretation there. Now, the, here the main point is that if you want to introduce temperature, you consider an Euclidean time circle, a compactified time, because it, what is uh, time in Lorentzian signature becomes the temperature in Euclidean signature because nothing depends on time, and so we ignore time and we somehow replace it by the temperature. So I'm not sure I'm completely answering the question. So why it has to be done in Euclidean signature is clear, and uh, it's clear that there is a Presentation as QFT in once we quantize the fields, uh, an interpretation of QFT in, uh, in, at fixed uh, and finite temperature. Now you may ask, okay, but when I go back to Lorentzian signature, what happens? I think the green functions will be affected by these choices, but uh, I don't immediately see how. It should be maybe a Lorentzian counterpart. Um, let me go on, uh, maybe just to also to clarify this. If I want to do QFT on this, uh, on this background, or for those that know ADS-CFT, if I want to consider the theory that is defined at the boundary, the QFT, the dual QFT boundary, I will come and say a bit more about this uh, later. But so far, think, just think about I'm doing QFT on this background. So we saw yesterday that we are computing a partition function, z of beta, that is trace of e to the minus beta h. This is what we saw. That would be the partition function, where h is the Hamiltonian of my QFT. But here we have imposed periodic boundary conditions for the fermions, in this case, instead of anti-periodic. So we need to stick in an extra minus sign, because we saw yesterday this partition function was computing um, the correct thermal uh, partition, the, the ther Green's functions for uh, fermions already, and the fermions anti-commute. But if we now want to have periodic boundary conditions, we have to take another sign to offset the sign that arises when I uh, have exchanged the fermionic operators in, uh, after doing the circle. I'll repeat this in a second. But the answer is that the partition function that we are computing is this one. So let me repeat, maybe it's not completely clear. So we saw this z of beta, that is trace of e to the minus beta h, also has a, a path integral interpretation of d phi e to the minus i Euclidean of phi. 
Okay, this is what we saw. We discussed this is equivalent to that. Uh, uh, upon imposing the correct boundary conditions, if we have a, fermion, a, a boson, I start from a point in the circle, I do a tour around, I come back there, it has periodic boundary conditions. Okay, we decide the bosons have periodic boundary conditions. Now we have to decide what happens to the fermions. If I start uh, here, I do a tour, I go do a tour, I, I come back there, and then I have to pass through the, the operator that was there in the, in the Green's function when I, when I exchange the two, and so I get an extra sign. So the correct thermal uh, boundary conditions are periodic for bosons and anti-periodic for fermions. This is also why people say this breaks supersymmetry, if you have supersymmetry, because there is a mismatch between bosons and fermions because of these boundary conditions. If you try to compactify on this circle, you get masses for the fermions because the antiperiodicity shifts the calusa klein mass and the bosons instead remain massless. The lowest levels remain massless. So you, you have a mismatch with supersymmetry because of this. But if we can decide ourselves, in this case it's possible, in other cases it may not be possible, that uh, instead uh, we take periodic boundary conditions for the fermions as well. We say, okay, we do the same, we exchange the operators here, but at the same time we introduce an extra sign so that we offset the minus one that we get. And so this is the partition function that we will be computing. This you have seen before these days, is the Witten index. So this is, you have seen uh, in Opadol's course. It was the Witten index if H is the, uh, is the anti-commutator of two supercharges. It generates the superalgebra. Of course, here I'm assuming you have supersymmetry, otherwise this doesn't work. But uh, it's just to remind you that you have seen something like that. So this fact that you compute the contribution of bosons minus the contribution of fermions, because there is a minus there, it's like an index. You are subtracting bosons and fermions. Maybe they contribute the same, the same amount, and so they cancel out, and something will remain. It is what is called the index. Okay? This is just to make the link with what Nopadol said. Yeah, I'm ahead. Now to discuss the phase transitions, ignore the fermions. But I wanted to make some extra comments because ultimately when we have something in ADS, we want to embed this in string theory and do some ADS CFT typically. So I'm just uh, making some comments for those who know a little bit of ADS CFT to see all this as a nice interpretation in string theory and also in the dual field theory, if you know what it is. And the dual field theory will be, um, will also has a part, have a partition function that will correspond to these ones. For, uh, for uh, uh, anti-periodic boundary conditions, I don't have the minus one. For periodic, I have the minus one to the F. Is it more or less clear? Do you want me to comment more on this? Or I come back to the comparison between the solutions? I come back to the comparison between the solutions. This was just a comment for those who know a little bit of ADSFT or uh, who can make the link between this and uh, what we have discussed, what we have seen with Nopadol's course. And in conclusion, for this spin structure, only one solution matters. So we don't have phase transitions uh, between uh, governed by the temperature. We may have other phase transitions, but not governed by the temperature. So if, I, well, if what I said here was not totally clear for you, don't worry, just forget about that. Let's just look at this other case. This case is what we have been studying so far, so it should be okay. So in this case, both x1 and x2 are allowed. So they can compete. The analog partition function that we are computing is the one without the minus one to the f. We have anti-periodic conditions for the fermions. 
and uh, now we should compare which of the two has the least action in order to see, to see which of the two dominates the canonical ensemble. So we should compute the action. So there is a method for computing the action in asymptotically ADS spaces, which is very well defined. It's called holographic normalization. But we don't need to do that. We just need to compare the two and see if the difference of the two has positive or negative sign, just to see which of the two dominates. So in principle, we should compute the action of x1. We can ask if the action of x1 minus the action of x2 is, uh, is positive or negative. Do you see, I'm, do you remember what we saw yesterday also? We have the partition function is e to the minus uh, i1 plus e to the minus i2. So I can write it as e to the minus i1 of uh, 1 plus e to the i1 minus i2. So, um, did I write it right? Yes. So if, if i2 is larger than i1, uh, this, is, this is suppressed. When I take the semi-classical approximation, this these functions, they, these factors have a 1 over h bar, so they become big, and this is suppressed. If instead uh, the solution 1 has a larger action than the solution 2, I have to reverse the, this expansion, and I see that, uh, that uh, uh, what is suppressed is a contribution of, uh, of the first solution instead of the second. So we just need to decide what's the sign of this difference to decide which of the two, because it's the one with least action that dominates. So if the sign is positive, uh, so in this case, uh, so the one with least action dominates, so it's uh, I2 that dominates, I of X2 dominates. And vice versa, if it's, uh, if it's negative, is I of X1. Okay, I'm not going through the computation. It's not the point of this discussion. But you can see it requires some care, again, because also it has infinite volume. So again, you need to regularize before computing the actual volume. And uh, so it's not obvious. In this case, yesterday, the contribution of the action of the Schwarzschild black hole in flat space was coming entirely from the boundary term, the gibbons hawking term. Here, the bulk term also contributes. So it's another computation. It's not the same, but it's similar in spirit. Did I put? No. Okay, well, this is what you get. And you see, this is a priori neither positive nor negative because it can change sign. Changes sign when, so when R plus is L, the difference vanishes, so the two solutions uh, are equivalent from the point of view of the statistical ensemble. They, neither one nor the other dominate. But if, uh, so if R plus is larger than L, if the black hole is big, compared to the DS scale. So if, let's see if uh, everything comes out right. If R plus is larger than L, then the um, difference here is negative. Uh, wait a second. It's negative. Okay, sorry, I, I should put a minus sign here. It's, uh, it's this, actually. I changed this, this, and uh, changed the, this, minus and, um, negative and positive, because this, I wanted to write the result in this way. I haven't done anything. I should have written 
minus sign there instead. This is the thing. So if, again, when R plus is larger than L, uh, this is negative. So it is the second solution that dominates. What was the second solution? The Schwarzschild black hole. So this makes sense. In, when the radius is big with respect to the ADS scale, it is the black hole that is important. When the radius, the horizon radius, the horizon again in, Lore in Lorentzian signature, is small compared to the ADS uh, scale, uh, it is the other solution that dominates that is just ADS. So let's uh, write the conclusion here. So we have two regimes, R plus larger than L. Remember these two parameters we have because R plus was related to W. So this I can trade for the mass, for W which was the mass. So when this parameter is larger than L, it means the black hole is important. You can also see that this corresponds to saying that the temperature, now we had a formula for B, you can plug the values there. The temperature is larger than 3 over 2 pi L. So the temperature is big. Um, and the, we have a large uh, black hole, X2. And this dominates. the canonical ensemble. When instead the R plus is le less than L, also the temperature is smaller than 3 over 2 pi L. And in this case, the solution that dominates, it is it's a thermal ADS5. It's solution X1 that dominates. So in the spirit of Zohar's course, you have uh, analyzed two regimes. One, he was talking about uh, huge, uh, large and huge uh, m squared, uh, and very negative m squared, and then he was make, deducing that something was happening in between, like a phase transition. This is exactly the same. For some values of the parameters, you have one phase, this one, for other values of the parameters, you have a different phase. When you tune the parameters so that you go from one value to the other, in between, he was drawing pictures like this, no? In between, you have a phase transition. So this is also the conclusion we have here. So you may ask, OK, why should I care about phase transition in, for black holes in ADS? Again, the reason is ADS-CFT. So for those of you that know some ADS-CFT, let me just say that all this, that is, these are results by Hawking and Page. So they were obtained in 83, I think. And they didn't know anything about ADS-CFT. They were just concerned with gravitational physics. But uh, when ADS-CFT was invented in 97, immediately after, so Witten uh, wrote a fundamental paper on that, where he interpreted this phase transition as a phase transition in the dual field theory. And then he wrote yet another paper just uh, one month after, elaborating on this, doing this in different dimensions, and understanding a lot of, of non-trivial physics in the dual field theory from these, uh, from these features. And uh, so let me just make some comments. I don't want to be systematic here. So if you take, for instance, type 2b on ADS5 cross S5, there is a dual field theory, which is an equal four superior Mills. So four dimensional uh, gauge theory with an equal four supersymmetry. So this solution, if you introduce the temperature, supersymmetry is broken even just by the boundary conditions. So you have uh, this field theory, which is supersymmetric if you have periodic boundary conditions, but if you uh, introduce the antiperiodic ones, you break supersymmetry explicitly. Um, and so it behaves more or less as Young-Mills theory with a bunch of matter fields, fermions and bosons, scalar fields, more or less. And uh, 
whatever happens on the gravity side, so there are two sides, no? the uh, gravitational side, that is what we have analyzed, and that what happens at the boundary, this field theory lives at the boundary of the gravitational solution, and therefore we should think an equal force superior mills is on the boundary of this space, which was S1 times S3. So maybe I should write just uh, schematically something. We have, uh, for the black hole, we had this geometry, S3, S1. So the boundary, this is the manifold M. The boundary is del M, that is S1 times S3. S S1 is the thermal circle. So the, the dual field theory is defined on this background. So it's young mis super young mis theory on a thermal circle with uh, end defined on a three sphere. So it's in also in finite volume. So normally in finite volume, you don't have phase transitions, but this field theory must be at large n. Large, this is a SUN gauge theory. And the rank of the gauge group n must be very large. At large n, phase transitions can also appear at finite, in finite volume. Witten discussed the, uh, this phase transition from the point of view of the field theory and interpreted it as a confinement, the confinement phase transition. Uh, okay, so let's uh, change gear now. So, so far we have considered basically classical theory. We have done some semi-classical approximations sometimes, considered the path integral, but never really computed the path integral. We, uh, we, will, we were just saying we interpret some classical solutions as saddle points of the path integral, but nothing more than that. And the theory that we considered was always GR, or GR coupled some other fields, but anyway, just a two derivative theory. But as I said in the very first lecture, uh, we know that this is not the final theory of quantum gravity, for sure. It should be seen as a low energy effective theory uh, that is valid at large, large distances where two derivatives are important. But then when we go to shorter and shorter distances, the higher derivative terms will become more and more important. These are suppressed by one of a the ma Planck mass squared, but uh, when I, my scale approaches the Planck scale, these terms will become important. So we should see, uh, in principle, we could, we could be even more ambitious and start to work in string theory, and then whatever we obtain from string theory will be obtained in the theory of quantum gravity. That's okay. But if we take a bottom-up approach, we would say, okay, we need to start correcting GR with higher derivative terms. These higher derivative terms may be random, or dictated by our UV complete theory. We know that string theory dictates the higher derivative terms in 10 dimensions, and then we need to reduce these to uh, four dimensions. Uh, this is a very hard task. Not all these terms are known, uh, but it's the picture we should have in mind. So the picture we should have in mind is that our action I is, contains certainly the Einstein-Hilbert term in the very low energy approximation. But then there is a bunch of derivative corrections. So this is a four derivative term. So in order to the dimension, I need to suppress it with one of the Planck mass uh, squared. I may have uh, other terms. This goes on. This goes on as a series, and it's, it can be very complicated. Again, I repeat, the, the coefficients here, in principle, are fixed by the UV theory. We have a term as a universal term that is always there in any theory of gravity that wants to match our world. And the rest depends on the way you try to do your quantum gravity. And uh, in the case of string theory, it is in principle dictated, at least in 10D. Then it depends also how you reduce down to 4D. This goes on. Uh, so now we may try to ask the same questions that we asked during the first part of the course for this higher derivative theory of gravity. For instance, uh, well, first, do black hole solutions exist? Uh, yeah, they still exist. Um, do black hole solutions thermodynamical laws? This is more tricky because 
In a sense, thermodynamics is something that arises when you coarse grain maximally. When you have a, a lot of degrees of freedom, you take the thermodynamical limit. Here, the thermodynamical limit is just going, taking the very large distance limit that is just GR. So it's not obvious that uh, when you go a bit away, in a sense, from the thermodynamical limit, you still uh, have black hole thermodynamics. It's not completely obvious, although the, the theory is uh, classical. Here, I, I'm not uh, yet studying any quantum correction. Uh, indeed, uh, things become more tricky. For instance, the second law in general is not satisfied. The fact that the area always grows or that whatever you associate with the entropy, um, to the entropy, because in principle the entropy is no more proportional to the area. That's one thing. Another thing is that entropy, whatever it is, does not always grow. The second law may not be satisfied. So these are questions that are in part open, depend on the situation, depend on the, they depend on the type of higher derivative corrections you consider. But uh, in all this mess, let's say, Wald in 93 was able to formulate uh, a, a formalism and an expression for the entropy that always satisfies the first law, at least. So there is uh, a notion of entropy in theories with derivatives that does satisfy the first law. So Wald's entropy uh, does this, satisfies the f uh, entropy. that satisfies the first law in, in this kind of theories, in theories with higher derivatives. And uh, so the formalism is rather complicated and we, do, we don't need it. So I'm going to spend the, just this board on Wald's entropy and then we will move to something else. But, so there is a formalism. The idea is that uh, um, the important thing is that uh, even in higher derivative theories of gravity, there, for at least for stationary axisymmetric black holes, there will be a killing vector that is null at the horizon, the one that I was saying generates the horizon. This killing vector that we call Xi. Okay, this is still there. And you can associate another charge to that. We even did that when we obtained the SMAR relation. We were computing the another charge, the, the coma integral in that case, but it's equivalent to the another <laughs> charge. Uh, associated, we were computing QC, if you remember. And this, in the end, was related to the area. So it's uh, more or less this construction uh, that uh, says that uh, you first construct the another charge of diffeomorphisms under the killing vector field, which generates the event horizon. So another charge for Xi. And this is basically the entropy. even if you have higher derivative terms. And uh, there is also an explicit formula that maybe will tell you something more, although it's not immediately related to what we saw in any way, but the entropy turns out to be this expression here. So what is this formula? It's a formula for the entropy. It's an integral over, a, if we are in four dimensions, it's an integral over a two-dimensional surface that is uh, called the cross-section of the horizon. It is basically the intersection of the horizon with a space-like hypersurface. We already did that when we had a two-sphere two at the horizon, precisely when we were deriving the SMAR relation. There was a, I was drawing something like there is the horizon, which is a null uh, hypersurface. And then there is a space-like uh, hypersurface. And the intersection here was a two-sphere S2H. It would be this. 
world first uh, formulated this in terms of the what is called the bifurcation surface, but uh, then it was shown that you can intersection. So any of these intersections would be okay. And uh, so this is H. So you integrate over this space. What? This variation of the action that is as complicated as we And then these epsilon are the B normal to this S2. When we showed the Mesmar relation, there was N wedge Xi. They were both normal to S2H. There was S2H, if you remember. And this was normal to it because Xi is normal to the horizon. And then N was the other normal to this two-dimensional hypersurface. And this epsilon is basically telling you which are these directions the normal direction, the b-normal, because there are two normal directions. Okay, now what you should be confused about is the variation with respect to the Riemann tensor. It's not something we are used to do. Usually we vary the, the action with respect to the metric. But so here are some rules. It's a formal right result. So you take the action. It's written in this way. You first uh, mm, move all the covariant derivatives in such a way that all antisymmetrization that you can do is the Riemann tensor. And then you are left only with symmetric combinations of the covariant derivatives. So you first need to play a bit with the covariant derivatives because there will be maybe complicated terms depending on many derivatives. And once you have done that, you consider the Riemann tensor as an independent variable and you vary with respect to it. So it may, it's not intuitive at all why it should work, but uh, it does. It's a uh, world's result. And uh, this is a notion of entropy that uh, boils down to what we know if you have just two derivative terms. So this can be proved. And uh, in higher derivative in this situation, uh, it has the virtue of satisfying the first law. If you remember, we used the SMAR relation when we checked the first law it's, uh, in a sense, a generalization of that in a much more complicated context, much more general context. So this is basically all what I wanted to say about this entropy. It's not something we will really need directly, but uh, um, it's necessary for what uh, I'm going to say now. Is there any question about this? It's very quick, I know, and, but uh, we don't need anything more than that. Instead, what I would like to do is to define at the end of today, uh, not necessarily, the quantum entropy. So something that should correspond to the full quantum gravitational entropy of a black hole, and that is in principle computable. So this, this is mostly the work of Ashok Sen and his recent work, recent work going from 2005 to 2010, roughly, more or less. And there are developments that are still being under investigation, um, and it will go on. But the, the good thing of this approach is that it gives some very concrete thing that you can, in principle, compute very explicitly. And of course, it cannot be as general as this setup, because it is extremely general, but um, maybe hard to handle, especially if you want to start quantizing things. Uh, but it works for extremal black holes. If you have supersymmetry, it's better. Things are better under control. But let's first not require supersymmetry and be more general. Let's just require extremality. So I first need to introduce, well, first it's, this chapter will be called uh, for extremal black holes. So what, what we are going to do is to first uh, define and recall what is an extremal black hole, just uh, for the sake of fixing things. And then we will see how Sen introduced the formalism that is quite simple and straightforward for computing the world's entropy if you have higher derivative terms. 
So this, we can still consider it as a classical theory in the sense that uh, if you want, we have integrated out some very massive modes uh, of our string theory, etc. We, we end up with a theory in 4D that has uh, the Einstein-Hilbert term and a bunch of higher derivative terms that are generated by integrating out these very massive modes. And we still have to do the quantum theory of this effective theory, right? It's usual, usual Wilsonian approach, for instance. Or in any case, you have to take care of the massless degrees of freedom by doing the quantum theory of that. So there are two steps. First, you write down the higher derivative theory like that by integrating out all what you can do. And then you still have the, to do the, the quantum theory the integral, uh, and quantize the theory to, to take care of whatever is at lower energy. So the first step uh, is quite easy and straightforward, is the, what is called the classical entropy function of SEN. And then there is the quantum version of that, that is the generalization of the classical one. So we do this in two steps. But before, we just need to see what is an extremal black hole, for those that have not seen it. Or anyway, if, even if you know what is an extremal black hole, I'm going to emphasize the features that are important in this discussion. So uh, recall what we saw for Kern-Newman. Come back to Kern-Newman once again. And uh, we, we had the various parameters. We had the mass, the parameter controlling the angular momentum, the electric charge, and maybe a magnetic charge, and we were assuming these conditions. We were assuming this. We assumed that. Because otherwise the R plus was not larger than the singularity in R equals zero. Um, now you can take a limit of this condition and saturate the bound. So assume that M square is exactly equal to this. This is the case uh, where, you, where people say you go to extremality. So this is the extremal black hole. It's a black hole of the Kern-Newman type, for instance, where you saturate this bound. And so the, the, you have matterless. And we saw that uh, this, so um, let me write this more explicitly. We will had uh, m that was plus or minus square root of m squared minus a squared plus p squared plus q squared. So if we saturate the bound, this vanishes. So R plus and R minus coincide. So the extremality limit is a limit in which you have two horizons, the inner and outer horizon, and then you merge the two. We already discussed this. Um, and uh, if you remember, the surface gravity was proportional to R plus minus R minus. So this means that this goes to zero and the surface gravity is proportional to the open temperature. So extremal black holes have a zero temperature and therefore do not radiate. Okay, so let me also, so R plus equal R minus, I will call this value of R plus equal R minus R star, <coughs> and this is equal to M, and we also decided that m is equal to the square root <coughs> of a squared plus p squared plus q squared. Okay, this we will use. So since these black holes do not radiate, you may think they don't have any thermodynamics, T0. But uh, the area uh, is not zero. So there is an entropy associated with them. The area, remember, was area over 4, so the entropy is, Bekenstein Hawking entropy, is R star squared plus A squared. It was R plus squared plus A squared for Kernium. Now we have uh, R plus, decided to call this R star to, to emphasize the time at extremality. So this is not zero, even if the temperature is zero. So one may think that maybe these black holes still have uh, some thermodynamics, uh, uh, temperature must be zero, so they don't radiate, but still they have an entropy. So one may want to understand, uh, for instance, the quantum version of this entropy, how it is corrected by quantum corrections. Um, 
So does this make sense? Well, we can think we have a finite temperature and then we tune, so there is well-defined thermodynamics. Temperature is finite, everything is of the type, uh, works in the way we go. And then we take a limit where the temperature slowly goes to zero. So the thermal circle uh, compactifies, but uh, the entropy remains finite. So there is a limit of ordinary thermodynamics by which we can recover extremal black holes. So in this way, we incorporate them in our thermodynamics. It's a limiting situation of what we know, where the temperature goes to zero. So this is the way to understand, uh, for instance, if I wanted to do the Euclidean approach and apply it to extremal black holes, in principle, it would be confusing because beta is infinite. So there is no identification of the thermal circle. So the way to understand this is to start with a finite temperature case. I have the good identification. I can do all my thermodynamics. And then in the end, take the limit, beta going to infinity. OK, the question is, uh, but I have a third law. Well, first, we didn't prove that the third law of thermodynamics works in the black hole case. Second, uh, we can do this formally. The third law says that there are no um, physical processes that allow you to reach the zero temperature case in a finite number of steps. So this is the statement of the third law. So you may think physically, in, uh, in, uh, in reality, I cannot reach extremity. But formally, in our theory, we can do it. And this is the way, the way to go. And why are we interested? So you're saying it's difficult to study extremal black holes. Why should I do that? It seems more confusing than helpful. But it's very helpful, at least theoretically. Now we want just to do theory, not uh, astrophysics. Um, no, astrophysics is interesting, but I mean, the question now is not to understand uh, near extremal black holes in the sky. The, the question is to understand what's the uh, microscopic origin of this entropy. This is what we would like to understand. We have to separate the questions a little bit. The, so here it's nice because we have separate question of understanding the entropy from the question of understanding Hawking radiation, which is leading to those sort of complications and information paradox and all that. So we want to separate the two problems, simplify our situation, forget about all issues with the Hawking temperature because this is zero, no radiation, no information paradox, and uh, focus on the question of the entropy. How does this get corrected, and how can we relate this to a microscopic computation? A, a computation that starts from microstates and counts the microstates and gets this expression in the end. So we want to separate the two problems. This can, can be done. And moreover, it's, uh, it's better defined. Also, the situation is better defined. So maybe I should even write it. Extremal. Um, allow us to forget issues with the uh, Hawking radiation. and focus on the entropy, and focus on us. Moreover, extremal cause, precisely because the temperature is zero, can be seen as isolated system. If the temperature was not zero, in order to consider a situation at equilibrium, I should have to consider a thermal bath at the same temperature. Yes? No, you are staring at me like, what are you saying? This entropy. This is non zero. Of ground states. That's what I'm going to say in a second. So let, I'll, I have a third point which starts with ground states. So the second point is this uh, extremal black holes are isolated system because I don't need to embed them in a thermal bath to be at equilibrium because they don't radiate. So they are uh, isolated system. So they are certainly easier to study. 
And moreover, since the temperature is zero, I don't have a thermal entropy because the entropy of, uh, I mean, because the temperature is zero, so everything is, is cooled down as much as I can. I don't have any thermal excitations. But uh, it may be that my, so I, the system goes down to the ground state because I switch off any thermal excitations. So it's down to the ground state, but it may be that there are many ground states, not one. If I count the ground states, I get a non-zero entropy. So this is the answer to your question. So it should be the, pro, uh, the entropy problem by problem I mean expressing the entropy as uh, in a statistical way as k, k Boltzmann k of the number of states of microstates log of z microcanonical the number of microstates. So this entropy problem. Uh, boils down to a problem of counting ground states. So uh, the idea is that these black holes that we say they have a huge entropy, enormous entropy, because there was one over uh, the Planck length squared in the denominator. So the, it's very, very big entropy. It uh, should correspond to a very, very high number of microstates, of ground states in this case, when I have a zero entropy, zero temperature. So all these three points here are good motivations for studying extremal black holes. So let's see more explicitly what is. No, the path integral is not the vacuum expectation value. It's the vacuum expectation value is the trace of one, but it's a trace over all the Hilbert space. So it maybe is not uh, just associated with one state. So Z micro, this is the microcanonical partition function, it may also have or not a, a path integral expression. Uh, this is uh, really the number of microstates. Uh, I can compute the grand, uh, canonical partition function. It will depend on some parameters, not the temperature because here it is zero. But so the grand canonical partition function may depend on some chemical potentials, and uh, there is no fixed number of states. We say that when you have chemical potential, there is no fixed number of states, right? It's fixed number of particles, for instance, is not. So then you take the Legendre transformation or Laplace transform, and you get Z micro. And this, I will be more explicit later. I understand this is not very explicit, but there is no reason to think that this is fixed or uh, one. Uh, I first have to understand what my system is, and uh, then I can discuss this. So let's take the kern human matrix and take the extremality limit. Also, I want to discuss the simplest case, so I take uh, a equals zero, let's switch off the rotation. Rotation introduced all these functions of theta that are a bit uh, cumbersome. So let's switch it off. I could include it, but uh, just for simplicity. Uh, a extremal kern human. Yeah, but if it's uh, A zero, it's a uh, Reisner Nostrum. Let's give it the answers. So it's extremal Reisner Nostrum solution that if you take our Kern Human solution and uh, you plug in these conditions here on plus and R minus into the polynomial delta that we had, you get this matrix. So here in Lorentzian signature, you have 
Here I'm not at, at, at extremality yet. I'll be in, at extremality in a second. So, with uh, small a equals zero. It takes this form, and I can also write the field strength, F. F is dA. Q over R squared dR wedge dt minus P sin theta d theta wedge d phi. And now this is the matrix uh, and the gauge field uh, before going extremal. If we take the extremality limit, you just plug R minus equal R plus here. I don't even need to write it. So uh, you just plug this condition. R plus equal R minus equal square root of R plus equal R minus equal M equal square root of P squared plus Q squared because A is zero. Recall that A is zero now. Now suppose we do that. We would like to see what happens as usual near the horizon. We always go and see what happens there. Now we, the two inner and outer horizon are just one horizon. We need to expand around so R, R plus equal R minus E, it was called R star, right? It's down there. So let's expand, expand, expand the matrix for R equal R star, one plus rho. So rho here for convenience is dimensionless co coordinate, radial coordinate, because I have R star in front, just for convenience. And I get at leading order, d s squared is minus rho squared d t squared plus r star squared d rho squared over rho squared plus r star squared d omega 2. And then it goes on. So do you recognize this part of the matrix? You should be careful because the, when we sh studied Schwarzschild, uh, it looked like that, but there was no one over rho squared here. So that was the matrix of flat space in polar coordinates when we went to Euclidean, or Rindler space in a Lorentzian signature. But here we have this one over rho squared, which changes things. So do you know what is this matrix? It's just a yes the near horizon geometry of black hole has some ADS2 factor here, and uh, this is always S2. This doesn't change. It's always S2 of radius R star. So this means that we don't have to identify our time. We saw this, I may not really discuss it here, but uh, we saw this for radius 5, that uh, the time didn't require identification a priori. Uh, so the point is that we should understand this in a limiting procedure, as I'm going to discuss in a moment, where we have finite temperature, and then we see that when we go extremal, the, there is no more uh, an actual temperature. Because here, there is no, we don't see the temperature. There is no need to compactify the Euclidean time, because the idea, this is ADS2. It, uh, the picture that uh, you can have is that there is a no long and infinite throat. But it's infinite, so you never have, it never caps off. It's like doing this, and then the temperature decreases, 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 and at some point it doesn't close off anymore. So up to here, it's always Rindler space, or flat space around here in a Euclidean signature. But when I reach extremality, I don't have this condition, and I don't need to compactify the Euclidean time anymore. because it doesn't clo close off. OK, the fact that you have an infinite throat is maybe not visible immediately in this course. But uh, well, you see that if I take uh, d rho, uh, rho, is, rho is e to the sigma, then the matrix becomes uh, minus e to the 2 sigma dt squared plus r star squared d sigma squared, something like this. 
So you see that it goes on forever. Sigma can take any value from plus infinity to minus infinity. It shrinks, but it shrinks at m sigma minus infinity, far away. This is why you can also measure the proper, the proper distance of uh, would-be horizon at its infinite. So I should just, OK, in five minutes, I think I can introduce the limit, the more specific limit that Sen uh, introduced that it will be convenient later in half an hour to, to discuss all the rest. So in order to understand better how we need a different uh, scaling limit to understand better the things, because here this uh, would be horizon has escaped uh, to infinity. We cannot reach it anymore. And uh, so there is a, a better scaling limit that allows to study the situation more, uh, more, uh, more clearly, which is the following. So let me just uh, say one, one other thing. Well, first, the fact that we have ADS2 that I'm going to confirm now, but we already see it from here. It's uh, important because it means that near to the horizon, I have more symmetries than before. Before, out of the horizon, or for other black holes that are non-extremal, I, I have these time translations, but then in the raw t direction, I don't have other symmetries. It's just uh, these time translations. But here, since uh, the raw core, func the functions of raw, um, um, take this specific form, I get the matrix of ADS2, and we know the isometries of ADS2 are, uh, so the isometries of ADS2 are SO to 1. So it's more than just one isometry, it's a three dimensional space of isometries. So we get more symmetry, and this allows to constrain the problem. If we manage to to go and zoom in into the near horizon geometry, we just have to care about ADS2. And uh, ADS2 is very symmetric. We gain a lot of gear to, to understand the problem. And how can we scale uh, near to the horizon? This limit is not very good because the horizon has gone away. So we have to take a better scaling limit that allows to keep the horizon at finite distance, go there, and then it's just ADS2. And then we say, okay, but the entropy problem is just the problem of understanding the horizon. And so we stay near the horizon and we do everything there. This is sen, uh, sense intuition. Is it clear? I'm going to express this more explicitly. So let me just call, I summarize what I just said is by saying better scaling limit. Let's change coordinates because we want to scale the parameters. So we want to approach extremality and at the same time scale the, co the coordinates. So T is going to become, so I change TR into T tilde R tilde. So first I change the coordinates. Um, T will be R plus squared T tilde over lambda. Then R is R plus plus lambda r tilde minus 1. So here lambda has dimension of a length, r tilde and t tilde are dimensionless. But okay, this is just for convenience. This lambda is a parameter. Lambda is a parameter. What am I doing here? I'm just risking a bit the coordinates in such a way that I have a parameter there. And then I want to take the parameter to zero at the end. Because uh, this parameter, I have to define what it is. I also relate this to the distance between the inner and outer horizons. So it can be expressed in terms of the square root of, of, the square root of p squared plus q squared. It's related to that. Do you see what I'm doing? I'm saying I want to. Uh, control the distance between the two horizons because they have to co coalesce. And this, the distance between the two, I call it lambda. 
Now I rescale the coordinates in such a way that lambda also appears in the, in the coordinate transformation. So that when I send lambda to zero, so that I go to extremality because these two approach each other, for instance, the new t with respect to the old t is rescaled in this way. And in this allows me to write a better result of the procedure. Is it clear enough? The idea of these transformations is always think about it at finite lambda. At finite lambda is perfectly fine. I'm going even to write down what's the matrix at finite lambda. It's a bit uh, long, but I want to, to make this very clear. So R minus is R plus minus 2 lambda. Yeah, sorry, it's not very well written. Yeah, I could also just write our twiddle, but it's nice to have this minus one. We will see it. Um, so let me write what I get. It's a bit long, but I hope you can see, but the, the explicit form is not so important. It's just to say that I implement of coordinates, I remove R minus by this definition, and I get this. So this is the matrix, and I can also write the gauge field, the field strength. OK, I've written. Uh, after the change of coordinates and after redefining R minus in this way, so I get rid of R minus from the matrix, uh, it's not visible, from the matrix up there, I take that one, this Reisner Nostrum black hole, not extremal yet. I remove R minus by this definition, change the coordinates, I get this long, uh, apparently more complicated expression. And this to come back to your question, is well defined for any value of lambda. It's equivalent to the previous solution. And now I want to take lambda to zero because I want to go to extremality. I want to implement R minus equal R plus. But instead of starting from that matrix up there, I do this here. In this limit, I'm also scaling the coordinates, so what I get in the end is not just replacing R minus equal R plus up there. These are the twiddle coordinates. So if we do that, we obtain, I think I can by now erase the word entropy. So give me five more minutes, I'll take this from the next speaker. With so, okay, we will start maybe five minutes later. Or at least I will try to finish in time before lunch. Um, so now, lambda going to zero, we go to the near horizon limit. We do the near horizon limit. Why is the near horizon limit? Because when lambda goes to zero, R go is close to R plus, you see? That's why it's also uh, it's a near horizon limit because R goes is close to R plus, and is also extremal limit and uh, extremal limit because R minus also goes to R plus. Okay, so taking the two limits at the same time. 
And in this way, the matrix... <coughs> Yes, no, it is, it is a good, uh, a good, uh, it's a limiting situation, clearly, but uh, it is well, everything is well defined. This solves the Einstein equations uh, and is equivalent to the previous solution. You may say, now that I take the strict limit, it's no more equivalent to the previous solution. It's true. It's the near horizon limit of the previous solution. It's, a, it's not the same solution anymore in the limit, but is what you call the near horizon geometry associated with the uh, extremal black hole. It's true, strictly speaking, is not equivalent in the limit. It cannot be, otherwise it would be the same, uh, the same effect. It cannot be not singular. Exactly, so, so far it is the same matrix. In the limit it is no more the same matrix, as both of you emphasized. And uh, uh, nevertheless, it is, it is connected in a clear way to the original solution. It's not just another matrix that I'm throwing in. So what done? And also to com comment even more, I was going to say this in a second, this limiting procedure guarantees that what you obtain here is still a solution of the Einstein equation. So even if you get a new matrix that is not equivalent to the previous one, um, because somehow the limit is a bit singular because this blows up, um, it's guaranteed that the solution is still the solution of the Einstein equation. So it's a solution to the Einstein equation by itself, describes what happens near the horizon, and for discussing the entropy, the intuition is that this should be more than enough. And the virtue of this is, is that it has the isometries of ADS2. So it's more symmetric space than the original one. So this is still solves the equations of motion, Einstein and Maxwell equations. And it displays the ADS2 factor. Here, this is ADS2 matrix. This is S2. R star is in front, is an overall radius. So the two in this case have the same radius. So the geometry, so this near horizon geometry is ADS2. So the isometries of ADS2 isometries are SO to 1. And then in this case of static, uh, we have no rotation. So we have this round S2. Uh, so we have uh, SO3 from S2. So we have a really lot of isometries. This space is homogeneous. So a constrained matrix. It cannot be, I have one free parameter. R star. In principle, I could rescale one with respect to the other, but in this case, there is no such rescaling, so there is just this parameter, and then I have some other parameters in the, in the field strand, but I cannot do anything else. I cannot uh, introduce new, new functions of R tilde or so, because it would break the isometries. So it's the only possible form of the matrix. So this clearly simplifies the problem of defining and understanding the entropy. This is one point. And the second is then uh, concluded from this and from many, many examples that uh, these features of extremality should be true in any theory, always. Even in the full quantum gravity theory, we define an extremal black hole as a black hole that in the near horizon geometry has an ADS2. S2 is a bit to the fact that this is static. So maybe it will not really be there, maybe it's squashed, fibered over the ADS2. But uh, from here, we define extremal extremality, let's say, as ADS2, as the presence of an ADS2 factor 
in the near horizon geometry. Let me write in quantum gravity, in quantum gravity. That is in any theory with high derivatives, quantum corrections. The idea is that the properties of the ADS2 should not be destroyed by all these corrections. All the rest could change. All the rest we have seen here could be modified. So this clearly is a huge simplification of the problem. And um, so uh, in a half an hour we will discuss how you can recover the entropy in general, not just computing the area, because the area is the Bekenstein Hawking law that holds for two derivatives, but more in general, how can we recover the world's entropy? It's really time to stop. We start at 11, say, 35.